Good morning. My name is Henry, senior pastor here at Bidwell Church, and it's a great joy and privilege to have all of you here with us today to worship Almighty God. Good for us to be in the presence of our God and also to receive the encouragement, strength, and support of God's people today. If you are a guest of our congregation, we're just so glad that you are uh, here worshiping with us, getting to know our congregation. We have a connection card through those double doors in this place called the Narthex. You can fill it out, you can give it to an usher, or just place it into the offertory plate later in the service. But we want to get to know you and how we can bless you as a church. And also, if you are um, worshiping online with us, whether as a regular worship attender or a guest, we're glad that you're participating in that way. We'd love to see you soon, sometime in person, as you are so able. Well, we are continuing this morning in our series of messages titled, That's Not In There, Five Things That the Bible Doesn't Say. We're wanting to get clear about these core convictions of our faith. And a couple weeks ago when I introduced the series, I had shared with you that just that sometimes we uh, misattribute certain quotes and statements to the wrong philosopher or teacher or historian or whatever. And I have to tell you, it's a confession. I almost got duped last week. I did online. You know, I was online. Someone on social media put this quote that's allegedly by St. Augustine, take care of your body as if it were going to live forever. Take care of your soul as if you were going to die tomorrow. And I thought, well, that may be true or maybe not, but that didn't quite sound like Augustine. Right, the, the, the foremost patriarch, uh, church father of the first millennia of Christianity. So I looked it up. Sure enough, it was erroneous. So friends, as we come here today, we come here in a spirit of God's grace and God's truth. And we want to uh, live every day as if we are going to live forever. Body, mind, and soul. And we do that in worship. We come here and we... Remember our purpose in life. We want to glorify God and enjoy Him. Sometimes we can lose sight of that purpose God's given to us. So let's enjoy God this morning with God's people, with praise, with prayer, and just togetherness in this beautiful sanctuary on this gorgeous day. And may we glorify God through our prayer and through our praise and through hearing the gospel. And on that note, let's honor one another by standing up and saying hello. Well, good morning, church family. So good to be with you all this morning. I do love this view of everybody greeting each other. Just let's stand and praise our God together as one body this morning.
and mercy all of our days. And you know, if singing about victory, singing about mercy and goodness does not feel how you feel this morning, does not express how you feel this morning, we are the body of Christ. Look to your left, look to your right, allow the Spirit of God in his body of Christ to move you. Watch the trees today, how they point north. Watch the mountains, how they point north. It's okay to not feel like you want to sing, but allow the body of Christ to lead you this morning. It's okay. We are here for one another. We are a community of people. We are a community of believers. Allow the hands to do the hands work. Allow the heart and the feet to do what they are supposed to do. And just turn to your left, turn to your right, and watch each other worship this morning.
to come on up. Come on up, kids. It is your turn in your church. Come on up. Come on up. So good to see you. I wish I knew all your names, but I don't. It makes me think how a teacher feels on the first day of school when she has all those new faces and she doesn't know their names. Same thing for you when you're new in a class, you don't know everybody's names, but I bet you're getting to know each other here quite a bit. So I have this book here. You know, I got it in church here. Is, is this book Winnie the Pooh? No? Is it Charlotte's Web? Well, what book is this? The Bible. And you know, in the Bible here in our church, we have a little piece of paper. And can you read what that says? Share prayer requests, answer prayers, and other information you would like us to know. It's a prayer request form, and it's in our Bible. So these two things show you two things that our church believes in, the Bible and praying for each other and singing to God like we just did, right? And having the kids be a part of the church. And so in this Bible, there's lots of books in it, and each book has a different name. And the first book is called Genesis. And Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, means beginning. It's beginning. And in the very first book of the Bible, God says how he feels about all of us. He says, when he made you, he said, it was good. God thinks it's good that you were made. He loves what he made. Make, think about, like, have you ever built something, a really cool Lego structure? Have you built something with Legos? Yeah. Have you ever helped somebody like build a beautiful cake. When you make something beautiful, you stand away, and sometimes you look at it and you go, that was good. I did a good job. That's a good-looking cake. Or that's a really cool Lego aircraft that I made. So that feeling God had when he made you is, gosh, he was proud. He was like, I made you, and you're beautiful. He put blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes. He put freckles, brown hair, red hair, curly hair, straight hair. And he said, it's all good. You ever wonder, like, why am I like this? God made you that way, and it's good to him. But even though he made us and we're good, sometimes we do dumb things, right? It says in the Bible that we fall short of the glory of God. We fall short, and that means we mess up. We do dumb things. We make mistakes. We sin. But because God says we're good, he loves us, and he wants to help us. He wants us to learn from our mistakes, and he wants us to get up and try to be like him. Seems impossible to be like God, doesn't it? But we have all these people in our lives who show us how to be more like God, how to be loving and kind. This is great to be a part of a church where people want to teach you. Like all these people in the green church, the Kidwell Park people, all of them, they just want to help you to know God better. And your parents and your grandparents, that's what they want to do too. So guys, you're going to get up right now and you're going to go to Kidwell Park. And as you go out those doors, junior high and high school can also leave. And the rest of us in here, because we love you and we know you're good, we're going to raise our hands and be praying for you as you go, okay? So you can get up and go and we'll be praying. Dear God, thank you for each one of these children. Thank you for the children who are homesick with hay fever or colds who can't be here. Thank you for all of the young people, and we pray that you would bless them and help them to know you better. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's always one of my favorite optics of the church, having our kids forward to offer a children's message. and. This right here, and we are really grateful to all you parents who entrust your, your wonderful, precious children uh, to our care here on Sunday morning for learning of God's word, God's love, and God's ways. But now we're going to have a, a time of prayer. 
We're going to bring our joys and concerns to our God, so would you please join me? Let's have a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of this day. Thank you for the radiance of the sun. Thank you for warmer temperatures, for extended time outdoors with family and friends and loved ones. We thank you for time and space and for beauty. We thank you for this sacred space that is our sanctuary and an opportunity to inhabit it and to be with you and with God's people and to be reminded of your purposes and promises for us. And God, there's so much to give you thanks for. We give you thanks for the meaning of daily work, that you have ordained our lives with purpose and meaning, and you have entrusted so many great things to our care. Help us to be faithful stewards of these things. We thank you for the joy that we receive and we dedicate um, all of our work, no matter how we define that work, to your service. We thank you, O oh God, for important people in our lives, family, friends, loved ones, co-workers. And God, we hold them in our hearts this morning. Uh, we pray for them. We ask for you to nurture these most relationships to you. And now in a moment of quiet reflection, we offer them to you, O oh God. Would you hear the private prayers of your people in silence? Friends, family, loved ones, we entrust to you. Hear our prayer, God. God, we also want to remember those who are difficult to love. We all have them in our lives. We have those who can make life difficult and trying for us, who test our mettle. Sometimes we choose avoidance. I pray for each of us that you would give us strength to not choose that path, but rather to learn to love actively as you have called us to love even our enemy, perhaps even most especially. And so we name those before you, God. We name those who are difficult to love. We present them to you. And God, we also pray for those we know in our lives who are estranged, who are lost, who we just want for you right now to give a great big hug to. We present them to you, God, those people in our lives who may be hurting. Would you hear our prayers? We offer them to you now in silence. God, the headlines can look bleak, and so we share with you the concerns we have for our nation and for our world. And Lord, help us to have open hearts to the pain that goes on in the world, as hard as it is to take it in and to have courage to pray. And so we share with you the things that trouble us right now. Maybe it's our divided political climate. Maybe it's the war in Gaza, or maybe it's Ukraine. Wherever there is pain and suffering, Lord, we pray for this world. Hear these prayers in silence. And finally, God, we pray for your church this morning. There are people all over the globe, all around the globe, who are worshiping right now. We pray for preachers. We pray for communicators on the platform, for musicians, for people in leadership. We pray for congregations. We believe the, the church is the great hope for the world. So bless your church that your gospel will be proclaimed, its grace and its truth. Lord, hear all of our prayers, and we know you will, Lord God. For we offer them in the strong name of Jesus, the risen and reigning Christ, who once taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, we have a really active mission arm at our church, and it's a great privilege, privilege for me to present to you Chris Garib, who is a member of our mission committee. She's going to share with you an exciting opportunity that is up and coming. Good morning. My name is Chris, uh, as Pastor Herring just said, and I'm a member of our mission committee. 
And I'm here to offer you guys an invitation to serve in Ensenada for a week in Mexico. This is a mission trip that I'm leading with our elder uh, Beth Reed in partnership with uh, Youth with a Mission, a missionary organization uh, as known as YWAM. Um, we are going to be staying and serving at Casa Ogar. Um, and uh, this is a home for children, and it also works as a, a daycare for the neighborhood. And the opportunities there are uh, many. Uh, we are going to play with the children. We are going to uh, deliver food baskets for families in need, visit a uh, home for the elderly, and even uh, hosting a community carnival for the community. So there are many uh, opportunities for all ages, all, all, uh, for the whole family. And, but the, the most important thing is that you're going to be connecting with the heart of God for the poor. Um, we are going to be growing in missions as a church together, and also you're going to be learning from our brothers and sisters in Mexico as we serve along with them. And um, yeah, so we have the dates for the trip. That's November the 24th, and goes, uh, we come back on the 30th. So it's Thanksgiving week. I'm sure you're going to have tacos for <laughs> Thanksgiving. <laughs> So it's a different way to spend Thanksgiving. And as I said, you can bring your whole family and serve together. Um, there is a limit. We have 20 spots for this trip. And we are planning to host a meeting in May for more information if you are interested. Um, so for this meeting, then we don't have a limit. So just come and just get to know more. And we go from there. So yeah. Oh, also we have uh, the sign up is going to be on our app. So just check it out. There is more information in there. Sign for the meeting. And that's it. I'm excited to see that happening. Thank you. Chris, thank you for this exciting opportunity. I want to ask one question. I know it's all on all of our hearts. Is will there be pecan pie <laughs> on Thanksgiving? Stuffing, cranberries? No? OK. Um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity that we have that's coming up for our church. It's, a, it's really a big ask, and I can't think of a better way to express your gratitude to God. So just um, do what you always do, thoughtfully and prayerfully uh, consider. This is something that God is inviting you to be a part of, and, and well done uh, for the mission team. Really, really excited. So we, we're an active church. We have a lot going on. I want to share a few more Opportunities for you to consider engagement at church life. I like to think there's at least one uh, invitation here that's tailor-made for you. Um, and all the announcements I'm sharing right now really just underscore that we are an intergenerational community, which is really um, something we're proud of here at Bidwell. So the first one is game night for students. Um, and that will be April the, the 26th. So if you are a student, um, if you're a parent of a student, then you can tell them about that. And... Um, I also think it'd just be fun if like 50 of you just showed up and just surprised Mary. I think it'd be really fun to uh, just, 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 just tell her that Pastor Ray told you to do that. Um, but uh, you all like games, right? So um, Praxis is up and coming. So for college and young adults, that is uh, tonight uh, actually in our fellowship hall. Remember there's dinner there. Um, and then the following week for college and young adults, we have the table, which is always hosted by a church member. More information on the website or the church app. Uh, together with Joy Groups, we are wanting to encourage just smaller communities here. And you may be wanting to get more connected to what we're doing at our church. Maybe you're wanting to make new friends here at Bidwell. This is a good way to do that. And you can go to the website uh, or church center app to sign up if you are interested in that. Deeper connection in church. We're having a Bible class for second through fifth graders. We are going to be distributing Bibles to those who take this class. Um... Uh, on Mother's Day, which is going to be really awesome. We're excited about that. It's a rite of passage for our kids. It's a gift we want to give to our church, presenting Bibles. So that will be happening May 12. Finally, and this is where I want to put some weight down and sharing what we're doing at our church, we are wanting to um, organize people in our church around a, a book called uh, How to Know a Person by the cultural commentator David Brooks. And really what this book does is it helps us to look at how we can foster deeper connections at home, at work, and throughout all of our lives. And uh, this book also takes seriously that right now we are in what's called a, a loneliness epidemic here in the United States. And so we believe this book has some really important things to say. 
and psychologists in our church, Len Matheson, is going to be hosting three different online sessions that will be on Wednesday evenings starting in a week. And we want to invite you, if you want to be a part of that discussion, we're also really wanting to use this book discussion to, uh, to serve our community. Um, we want our community to critically engage the contents of this book because we think it's that important. So if you know someone you can invite, great. If you just want to come, great. Um, I've been sharing this book with a lot of people in the community. I think it's so important. And we'll also be doing more in the fall, so that won't be the last opportunity, but wanted to put that on your radar. And friends, all the things that I just shared are happening at Bidwell because of your incredible financial support. You're doing a great job supporting our church. So from the bottom of our heart, um, my, our church board, our staff, we want to say thank you. Um, all this is possible because of you and God's incredible faithfulness to Bidwell, a church of 157 years old. It's just absolutely amazing. And here we are just thriving out of the throes of the pandemic, doing so many great things. We're excited about what God is doing. And you have a chance now to support our church uh, financially. All the modalities are listed up there on the screen, one of which is we have ushers that come forward and receive the offering. So if you want to present a gift to our congregation um, and for your God. That way you can do that as well. And we always give um, out, of, out of gratitude for what God is doing in our hearts, in our lives, and in his church for the sake of the world. So we give now from our hearts. The ushers may come forward.
So good. Thank you. Thank you, praise team, for leading us this morning. Hello, church. Good to see you this morning. I want to welcome all of you. I want to welcome also you if you are joining us online. So glad you could be here. Wherever you're seated, we're glad that you're here and we're glad to be with you this morning. My name is Pastor Ray. I want to thank Chris for sharing the beautiful... I don't know where you went, Chris. You're, you're somewhere. You probably went home. I'd go home. I mean, she was here at 8.30. I mean, you know, a church is good, but not two hours sometimes. Anyways, Chris, I want to thank you if you're watching online because I got to spend some time with her at YWAM, Youth with a Mission, this week, which is not too far, and uh, walk with some missionaries through the Gospel of Mark. And it was so enriching. I got to be a teacher to missionaries. What are they thinking? <laughs> it's really cool, though, like from all over the world, Turkey, Brazil, Mexico. So it was just and as the teacher, if you're a teacher of Scripture, you're also a learner. I learned so much. So I'm thankful for that opportunity. And really think the Mexico trip is a great thing. And uh, thank you to our team again for leading us and for Henry for introducing us to some of the themes this morning. Um, we're going to get into it this morning. We're in a series of talks on popular sayings that some mistake for biblical sayings. That's what we've been up to since since the second Sunday of Easter, and these are honest mistakes, honest mistakes that people make. Jesus never said, you do you, or go get yours, or yo, this light is lit. Actually, in a paraphrase, Jesus may have said something like that, but today's example in classical language is to thine own self be true, and in more modern parlance, be true to yourself. Be true to yourself. So if you're going to go trying to find something that would validate that perspective in the Bible, a proverb, a saying of Jesus, you'd find sooner or later that that's not in there, and that's why we're in this series. By the way, that's not to say that if it's not directly from the Bible, it's patently false. That's not what we're saying. In fact, that would invalidate some of my favorite bumper stickers in town. And we don't want to do that. For example, um, adults on board, we want to live too. <laughs> I love that one. Here's another, one of my faves. There's no reason to tailgate me when I'm doing 50 and 35. And by the way, those flashing lights look ridiculous. <laughs> so just because it's in or not in the Bible doesn't make it false. But if we're going to live, hear me now, if we're going to live in a culture where to follow Jesus, often many are too busy or uninterested or downright condescending to what it is to believe, live life in Jesus' name. If we're going to follow Jesus in a culture like that, then we're going to want to examine some of the big assumptions, some of the big ideas on which our culture stands. Stuff parading itself like wisdom and certainly... What is obvious, perhaps, in our culture is be true to yourself. It's so obvious that that is a good and beautiful way to live. As obvious as if life gives you lemons make. It's just common sense. And we're going to see that Jesus, when Jesus speaks to us, speaks something a little different than be true to yourself. And it may sting a little. Sometimes when we're reading the Gospels, we go, ow, that hurts. Or, ooh, I can't get my head around that. Or, really, Jesus? But we'll see in reading Jesus that it's actually the path. It's actually the path to the life that is really life. So we're going to read from John chapter 8 this morning. And before we do, will you pray with me? A prayer of illumination. Lord, in Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit, we thank you and invite you into this place. We, I come before you humbly. I know that it's hard to talk back to culture sometimes. And yet, as a Christian community, we do so in hopes not just to be right, not just to be correct, uh, not just to be better, no, Lord, but also to uh, really present this vision that Jesus does of what it is to be fully human. And so I pray that prayer this morning that we might walk on that journey toward our full humanity that you love us and call us to, in and through your son, Jesus. So may these words, God, may there be ears to hear and eyes to see. We ask in Christ's name and all God's people said. This is John chapter 8, a little context. We're jumping into a conversation. John, beautiful, wonderful, the Gospel of John. Great book. 
Um, but uh, the, the conflict within John is ever-present between Jesus and his own people, especially the religious authorities, but also his own people. And so they're cast often in John's gospel just as the Jews. John didn't have modern sensibilities like we do. So this tension between Jesus and the Jews is a, what you might call an in-house tension, right? It's between how he is manifesting the law of God and how he is living out the values of his tradition and how his people are and the disconnect. And it's just conflict all over the place, and this passage is no exception. So I want you to hear, this is like, we're at this pinnacle moment in John's gospel where it's just, things are coming to a head, and we're going to jump in this conversation. Here's how it goes. So to the Jews who had believed him, notice that phrase, to the Jews who had already believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. If you hold to my teaching. Also, another translation, if you abide in my word. Another translation, if you continue in my word. So if you hold to my teaching, then you are truly my disciples. And then this, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's all good so far. But they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replies, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So, if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants. You were looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence. And what you are doing... You are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's offspring, Jesus said, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you're looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham didn't do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. And Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native tongue. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. (laughs) Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you don't hear is that you do not belong to God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord, and so we respond collectively. Thanks be to God. Ouch, Jesus. I love how he's not hippie or buddy Jesus right here. He's the Jesus as presented to us in the Gospels. And he doesn't always, like, feel good, right? Certainly not here. So I'm going to ask you to do a thing this morning. This is an unusual sermon in this sense. I'm going to ask you to think. (laughs) Okay? I'm I'm not just going to, like, it's not going to be a, I need your participation mentally Okay, I told 8.30. I'm sorry I didn't say this to them in the beginning. Because it's, it's like, we're going to do a little thing called perspective switching. Uh, perspective switching. And to do that, I'm going to tell you about my weekly tradition of going to Monkey Face. And I do every week. Love to go to Monkey Face. I get up there. I like to go in the morning. I'm not going to tell you what day. Don't meet me. I'll bring my coffee, and it's not a bad hike, you know, 15, 20 minutes, no big deal. And I'll sit up there, and I'll breathe more deeply, and I'll pray, and I'll connect with God. And I'll think about all the movies involving time travel and the problems with those films. A lot, a lot of night, just some space, you know what I mean? And I get up there, it's beautiful. And on the way up there, as I approach Monkey Face in my car, you know, like driving into Upper Bidwell, on the way to that hike, I always, like, go, ooh, where's the monkey? Like, I, I, like, I want to see it, you know? I like the name. So it's just like, and every time I'm like, can I see it? Oh, there it is. There it is, the eyes and the little muzzle. 
And uh, I see you turn to the side. I'm like, it's amazing. But one thing I can't see on monkey face while standing on it is monkey face. Can't see it. I'm on it. I'm literally standing on it. But I do see the ground that I was just standing on while driving in. And I get to see the ground that I was just standing on while driving in in a whole new way. I get a perspective that I didn't get while standing at the base of the mountain. And I get a perspective while standing on the top. And that's perspective switching, right? And I can see monkey face from the ground, but I can't see what, while I'm on it. And I can see things about the topography while I'm monkey face that I can't see while I'm standing there. And that's, I think, how belief works. Beliefs. Like you can't doubt a belief without standing on another belief. You can't see it or critique it, right? And so we're going to play a game called perspective switching this morning. Perspective switching, because I want you to see Christian belief, Christian belief from the ground, if you will, as if looking up at monkey face and going, really? That's interesting. And I want to do it because I want to do that perspective, and I want to stand on the belief that be true to yourself is the best way to live. And I want to do this because John... And John's gospel says this to us at the end of John. John doesn't believe that be true to yourself is the best way to live. This is what John says. This is a summary of John's gospel. These are written so that you may believe, you may literally stand on Jesus and his kingship, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the life that is really life. You stand on this. And yet we live in a culture where... That belief, standing on Jesus Christ is the best way to live, is at best trivialized. Trivialized. Like, a lot of religious language is used as a marketable commodity. One example, the word indulgence, which used to be like a pretty bad thing. Like, it meant you were indulging sin. Now it means you've eaten too much chocolate. You see how that, like, and by turning it into, like, something that, you know, and I like chocolate too, but by changing the way we understand the word indulgence is now just a guilty pleasure. There it is again. And religious language gets retooled for marketing purposes, and it also becomes trivialized. So when we hear words like sin and the devil in our culture, these words don't quite sometimes have the gravity that they did when Jesus presents them in the original context. And so Let's continue to stand on the ground and look at Christian belief from that trivialized perspective. Because here's another belief that I think is trivialized in culture is that humanity is bad, negative, pessimistic view of what it means to be human. And often culture will look at the church and look at the belief system that is Christianity. We're thinking here, remember? And they're going to look at it and say, that's not the best way to live, because humanity's not bad. I'll give you two examples of the way that shows up. I was on Instagram earlier this week, just for research and development purposes. (laughs) Not like I hang out there or, like, watch what people are doing. It's not a thing. Anyways, there's this one influencer who is walking down the street, and he's one of these, like, used to be a Christian, now not so much anymore, and he's whistling, and he's got his chai tea latte, And he's like walking all like hunky-dory down the sidewalk. And the caption reads, That moment when you realize you're not a depraved sinner in desperate need of salvation and going to hell after all. And there it is. There's like a negative. See how negative Christianity is? It's so pessimistic. Lighten up. Whistle and go to Starbucks. I don't know. On a more personal note, I remember sitting across from a young person over coffee, who had been raised in the church, a church I was currently serving in. And she was having some really challenging times with her family. Her family was going through a lot, and she had started going to group therapy sessions. And she had decided that the only thing her church had really given her over the years is a deep sense of guilt. And I remember her saying to me very candidly, that she was being encouraged to think in a different way, to discover who she really was beneath all that guilt, to forgive herself, and to find the freedom that comes from not, tell, not letting other people, rather, tell her who she was. And I just had no answer in that moment for her. I was like, wow. 
Because on the one hand, I was like, man, I mean, I don't know if we were listening to the same messages, but really, that's all you took away is guilt? And maybe, maybe for you right now, there's this other way to live. Be true to yourself. Forgive yourself. Don't let other people's expectations shape who you are. Actually seems better than every sermon you heard on Sunday. So that's the idea here. When we're standing on the ground looking at Christianity, that Christianity can be pessimistic. It can be, it can have a negative view of self or a debilitating view of self. Whereas be true to yourself. One web, website I visited summed it up so well. Being true to yourself is about living authentically. Ooh, doesn't that sound good? Authenticity? Being who you really are? That's Merriam-Webster's 2023 Dictionary Book of the Year. Or excuse me, Book of the Year. Word of the Year. Could be a book too. You can write it. But it was the Word of the Year. Authenticity. It's a strength. It's a virtue in our culture. And to be true to yourself is a path toward authenticity. The website goes on. It is about being truly who you are as opposed to being fake or trying to fit in. Who wants to do that? Or living according, this is my favorite, or living according to other people's values and beliefs instead of your own. Where does that put Christian belief? Like looking at Christianity from that perspective. Well, it's other people's beliefs imposed on you, not your own. It's not being true to yourself. It's being true, I don't know, to your tradition or your family or religion. And that's outside you, not from within you. It's not the best way to live. It's not the life that's truly life. And it's quite easy to look at Christianity from that space and say, ah, but how negative and pessimistic and cynical and debilitating is the Christian view of self because of sin and the devil? So you're standing on that ground with me, and you can kind of see it, I hope. But now let's go for a hike. Let's go on top of monkey face. And we're going to look back down on this be true to yourself belief system. And we're going to look at it from the perspective of who else but Jesus. And I'm going to do it just from John's gospel, because I don't have to go very far in the scriptures to see two beliefs about the self that are very present throughout the text. First, the self, the human being, you and me uniquely are made in God's image and made with dignity and worth and value. That is true of all of you. To say that Christianity is pessimistic about the human condition is to forget that Genesis 1 verse 26 says, and God made them male and female in his image. Of all creation, everything's good, 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 five days over, and then we get to humanity and God goes, ah, very good. That's the first word. It's also, by the way, the last word. You're good and God has made you for good and you can act for your good so there's a lot of positivity. In fact, I, I think it's way hopeful and way more optimistic than most mantras in our culture. Even be true to yourself. Christianity is entirely optimistic about the human condition and about how God made us good and how about we can work for our own good because Jesus has given us grace. Hallelujah and amen. It's so optimistic, it's unbelievable. What about the resurrection isn't optimistic? It's like this is your destiny to live risen and raised lives with Jesus now there's opportunity, and it lasts forever. Let's throw a party. See, it's good. It's good. We're optimistic people. And so we're the most optimistic people we should be on planet Earth. And we should also be the most pessimistic people on planet Earth. <laughs> That's right. It's a both and, not an either or. Let me give you an example of three optimistic examples. Jesus was walking by a leper, John 9, right after this text we read. And his disciples are like, hey, Jesus... Who sinned, <laughs> this guy or his parents, that he was born blind? There's the label, sinner. And Jesus goes, oh, you got it all wrong. This guy's blindness isn't the result of sin, him or his parents. This blindness is so that you can see and I can see and we can all participate in the powerful change that God is going to do in his life and in yours. And then Jesus invites this blind guy on a journey of healing. The guy has to get up. The guy has to do what Jesus tells him. The guy at the end of the story, John 9, is the only person who really sees, not just physically, but spiritually. And he worships Jesus. It's this beautiful picture 
not just of the fact that God, excuse me, Christ calls him to good, but that it requires the goodness in him to participate in what God is calling him to. I'll give you another example. Earlier in John, there's a leper, and this guy is full of apathetic excuses. I don't want to get up. I don't want to be healed. There's all this healing going on around him, and he never gets up in time. And Jesus comes up to him and says, what do you, would you like to be healed? What would you like me to do for you? Like, I'm not just going to do it for you. I want you to participate in acting for your own good, because I know you have it in you. It's like that's what he was saying to him. I know you have it in you. And the whole story, John 5 now, is the story of this guy taking steps toward his own healing and transformation, even though nobody else believed it even happened. It's an amazing, every story is also a parable about what it's like to do life with Jesus. Final examples, Thomas in John 20 The one guy who wasn't with the disciples when the risen Lord appeared, he's like, forget it, I don't believe it, it's a bunch of nonsense. And then the next time he shows up for some reason, his friends are like, no, come, come see, come pray with us. And he does, and Jesus meets him right where he is and says, come and feel the nail holes in my hand, see and believe. But blessed are those who do not see and still believe. And so John, and Thomas, that story, Jesus meets him right where he is, but then calls him to the good of something greater. And in so doing, he calls all of us to the good of something greater. How optimistic is that? And yet, Jesus, at the same time, like in the passage we just read, can say things like, you're living lies, and you're enslaved to sin, and this is your reality. And notice, I want you to notice in the text we just read, John 8, that one that was like, ooh, ow, that stings. The way in which every time the people, the Jews, respond to Jesus, they totally resist him. In fact, the resistance is the problem in John. And it's not about the Jews as a people group. Because remember what I said when I was reading the text, it's about those who believed in him. These people were insiders. They were already in. They were already ready to follow Jesus. They were doing the things, all the right things. And Jesus is like, yes, good, good, but you're also enslaved to sin and living lies. It's like, that's your reality. And if you want true freedom, you're going to follow me on this journey. You have to work for your own good. You have to walk into it with me. You have to trust me. You have to believe that this is the life that is really life. And each time they resist, they're like, you don't understand, Jesus. We're not really slaves. We don't experience what you're talking about. Or they'll say, actually, Jesus, we're children of Abraham. We have this long legacy and tradition and history that we stand on. Or they say, no, 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 we're in right relationship to God. And each time, Jesus will say, actually, you're not free. Legacy can't help you. And this whole idea that you're in right relationship to God, while true, does not mean that you're not living lies. And so Jesus presents us with this very complicated picture of humanity, both and very good, very beautiful, the ability to work for our own good, and at the same time, living lies and enslaved to sin. And this, I don't know about you, but now having looked at the human condition from the top of monkey face, we can also see how be true to yourself. What self? Which lie? Which destructive sin pattern in our life should we be true to if that is indeed who we are? That's at best naive, and at worst, really dangerous way to live. And I don't know about you, but when I look at the world we live in, I see so many acts of compassion and goodness and generosity. I see it in people I know. I see it in myself. I see myself show up. I see people on the news show up. I see non-Christians show up and do good in the world and work for justice and extend forgiveness. And I see, at the same time, immense social division and racial injustice, and I see uh, gun violence with no apparent motive or purpose. I see rampant mental illness. I see suicide rates increasing. I see people living into destructive habits and patterns generationally passed down. And I look at that world, and I say, hmm, be true to myself? Or God made me for good, but there's this really destructive way in which I can live lies and I can be entangled in sin. Like, I actually think that makes a lot more sense. There's this beautiful book that I read on self-deception 
The title of the book was called, I Told Me So. <laughs> Such a good title. Such a good title. And I love it. Tin Elshoff, the author, says that people avoid looking at their own complicity in injustice and at their own destructive behaviors because it's just psychologically difficult to do that. And he gives the example from another author, Mike Martin, who took Albert Speer, great name, Albert Speer, strong name, Hitler's powerful minister of armaments and war production. This is the guy who designed Auschwitz. And here's what Martin says about Speer. Speer was described as a talented architect, a bureaucrat, a loving family man, and considerate to his circle of peers. But Speer also refused to investigate the happenings at Auschwitz. Why? There's the quote. I love this. This is Mike Martin on Speer's. He diverted his attention so thoroughly as to render psychologically manageable what would have been morally unthinkable if he confronted it squarely. Translation, this guy lived lies. And he was a great guy. He was a great guy. I've also read a little, not a lot, a little about, <laughs> talk about like the other side of this spectrum, but Mother Teresa, who actually lived a, a very tormented life. I mean, she was tormented in certain ways by her, just her own worthiness as I understand it. And yet, Mother Teresa gave her life in service to Jesus, like almost no one in the 20th century. And this is what was so beautiful about her example that I see. She would get up in front of crowds of people and offer the most trite and simplistic phrases. Things like, Jesus loves you. You're God's children. Like she didn't have a sermon. It wasn't all prepared and packaged and on a Kindle. And people would just be wrecked and move to tears and give their lives, their whole lives to service to God just from hearing her say that in person. And you got to wonder, why is that? You know why? Because Mother Teresa was authentic. I mean, she was the real stinking deal. And yeah, she struggled psychologically. And yeah, she it wasn't always rosy and peaches and, you know, I'm good and great and God's called me to good. But man, because she gave her life, because she continued in Jesus' word, there's someone, there's someone who looks free. Free to give and receive God's love. Free to be who God has created her to be. Free to participate in restorative work with her whole life. And that's my hope for me. <laughs> not that I'm going to be Mother Teresa, <laughs> as if. And not that you could be either, but <laughs> maybe like God has a specific way that you are most free God has a specific end for your life that is most beautiful and most good. And to get to that end, you don't be true to yourself. You just be true to Jesus. And in that journey, on that long, whole, lifelong journey, you discover who you really are. At least, that's what John is telling us about standing on Jesus the Christ. That I have included these stories, John says, remember, John 20, 20? So that you might believe, that you might literally stand on this statement that Jesus is who he says he is, the bread of life, the water of life, the good shepherd, the light of the world, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and life. And that by standing on this belief, you might live the life that is really life. That's John's invitation. And so may we, may we go on this journey with Jesus. May it start today. What does a step forward look like? And we can evaluate the perspectives all we want. At some point, we have to act. And so I'm asking you, church, what does it look like for you to walk with Jesus, to abide in his word, to continue in his way this week, this year, your whole life long? So at the end of your days, me and you both, we're standing on this truth with absolute confidence saying, if the sun makes you free, you are free indeed. Amen? Let's pray.
Lord God, we give you thanks. Thank you that you are a good God who invites us into goodness and our own goodness. And to do that, Lord, may we recognize also that our tendency to be enslaved and living lies. And may that not be bad news this morning. May that, may that be liberating news. May that be news that causes us to work for our own good. And may we do it by your grace, not apart from it, but by your grace. May that be the enabler here. May we be touched. May we be healed like the leper and the blind man and Thomas. That we might start that journey or that we might take one more step. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and all God's people said. Amen. Thank you, Ray. Let's stand. This is a song of response. You can sit, you can stand. Um, let's just sing out in the Say 
It's beautiful when the music matches the message that well. Amen. So I'm going to bless you with this benediction. Go forth into this world in peace and have courage. It takes courage. And hold fast to the good, the good in you and the good in everyone else. And render no one evil for evil, but support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve the Lord your God. Continue in his word, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go before you and be within you, both now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Go in peace.